Welcome to Learn This Game, where you can learn about tabletop games and how they are played. In this presentation, we'll be looking at Silent Victory. In this video, there will be a general description and overview of the game. We'll inventory the components, and we'll go through gameplay, including setup, one complete sample patrol, and victory conditions. There are helpful links in the description, as well as a timestamp index. If you want to go straight to the setup and gameplay, you can go to the timestamp index now. And if you find this video helpful, please like, subscribe, and share. You can also leave a comment to share your experience or let us know what game you'd like to see reviewed. Your participation really does help the channel continue to grow and provide more content. Silent Victory was first published by GMT Games in 2016 and designed by Gregory Smith. In this solitaire tactical war game, you are in command of an American submarine during World War II. Your mission is to destroy Japanese shipping and warships. This game is recommended for ages 12 and older. The difficulty level is low to moderate, and each game takes about 2 to 3 hours to play. Silent Victory is intended for solo gamers, but there are also rules for multiplayer and tournament play. An app is not required, and there are no official apps for this game. However, there is an unofficial app to assist with generating patrol encounters. The link is in the description, but be aware that the site is not secure. Designer Gregory Smith has designed other historical war games, including the similar submarine games Beneath the Med, The Hunted, and The Hunters. Now that you've seen a brief introduction to the game, let's get into the game itself. This is a solitaire tactical historical war game that uses paper mats, counters, logs, and dice. Thematically, the game is based on U.S. submarine warfare against Japan and the Pacific during World War II. Now let's see how the game is won. The object of the game is to sink as many enemy ships as possible as you conduct numerous patrols as an American submarine captain in the Pacific. This is one of the patrol maps that shows the different areas in the Pacific where patrols can be conducted. The patrol log sheet is used to track the activity and success of each patrol. Each line on the sheet displays a month and a year, starting with December 1941 and ending with July 1945. A full game consists of completing numerous patrols up to and through July 1945. You may not necessarily start your first patrol in 1941, depending on the submarine class you choose to captain. The bottom of the sheet will show the total patrols, ships sunk, and total tonnage at the end of the game. This will help you determine the level of victory. To determine your victory level at the end of the game, consult the patrol log sheet and add up the total tonnage of ships sunk. You suffer a defeat if you sink under 10,000 tons. You also suffer an automatic defeat if your submarine is captured due to an unsuccessful scuttle attempt or you are relieved for cause. Other potential results include a draw, marginal victory, substantial victory, or decisive victory depending on the final tonnage sunk. Should you be killed in action as captain, you still determine your victory level posthumously. The same applies if you are taken prisoner. Now let's look at the components. Silent Victory comes in a 2-inch cardboard box and contains the following. A 28-page rulebook which includes designer notes, optional rules, and rules for multiplayer and tournament play. Nine submarine display mats which correspond to each American submarine type available. This mat is the centerpiece of gameplay. One submarine combat mat used to resolve combat against shipping targets. There are 298 counters and two die-cut sheets. They represent individual ships, aircraft, crew members, individual torpedoes, ammo rounds, random events, and the status of crews and systems. The counters are referred to as markers in the rulebook. There is a patrol log sheet that should be copied before initial play. There are five two-sided player aid cards with charts and tables used to resolve game functions. There are three patrol map cards whose use is optional. There are eight double-sided captain cards that can be used for optional historical patrols. And lastly, there are three six-sided, one twenty-sided, and two ten-sided dice. Now let's set up the game for our playthrough of a sample patrol. The first step is to select the submarine type, of which there are a total of nine. We elect the Gato class submarine and place this display mat in the play area. This mat is the centerpiece of gameplay. Typically, you will captain the same boat until the end of the game or until sunk. The submarine display mat includes information to be tracked on the commander, crew, ammunition, submarine damage, and patrol. The top of the mat shows the submarine type, availability date, which will be important to know for the patrol log, 
and the torpedo load available by date. Since we are starting in April 1942, we will have a starting torpedo load of 24 Mark 14 steam torpedoes. You may select a submarine type prior to this date. Earlier start dates allow for more patrols, but later start dates have more advanced submarines available. Torpedo availability also changes over time, allowing you to add electric and acoustic torpedoes to the steam torpedoes. Now let's start placing the markers. First, we'll place the starting officer rank of lieutenant commander, which is the first of three possible ranks. Next, we'll place the trained marker in the crew quality box. Then, we'll place the deck gun and the amount of ammunition indicated on the mat. We then place the anti-aircraft gun markers. For game purposes, these have unlimited ammunition. No decoy markers are placed at this time since the patrol start date is before January 1945. We then place the hull damage and flooding markers next to their respective tracks. We then place our 24 torpedoes in the forward and aft torpedo tubes with the balance in the reload areas. The number tubes can only contain one torpedo each. On the Gato class submarine, there are six forward torpedo tubes with 10 reloads and four aft torpedo tubes with four reloads. In this case, we only have one type of torpedo. You may adjust the torpedo mixture by up to four once different types become available. We confirm that the total capacity of the reload boxes is not exceeded by the number of remaining torpedoes. Once loaded and placed on the display mat, torpedoes may not be transferred between forward and aft positions. Any applicable markers for crew status and damage to systems will be placed in this area. We will place the Gato submarine marker and Pearl Harbor base marker on the import refit box. The base used will depend on when we start the game and the submarine type, as covered in Rule 7.3. In this case, for patrols that start in January 1942 or later, we roll one 10 sided die. A result of 1 to 5 means we start in Australia, and 6 to 10 means that we start in Pearl Harbor. A Narwhal class submarine always starts in Pearl Harbor. The last section on the mat lists the different patrols we may be assigned. Each patrol consists of a series of travel boxes and each travel box represents three to four days on patrol, such as this one for the Marshall Islands. When conducting patrols, our submarine progresses through each travel box on the assigned patrol track while checking for possible encounters and random events. Between patrol assignments, our submarine will be refitted at our base in Pearl Harbor for one or more months based upon any damage incurred or crew injuries. We may also use one of the optional patrol maps which has the same travel boxes as the submarine mat. These maps are not needed for play, but do provide a visual reference to show geographical context. The travel boxes are identical to the ones on the submarine display mat. For the purposes of this playthrough, we will only use the travel boxes on the original mat. We then place the five player aid cards and combat mat nearby for use during the game. The player aids will have the charts and tables needed to resolve various functions, and the combat mat will be used for encounters with ships. We also place the dice and remaining markers nearby. Finally, we prepare the patrol log sheet for play. At the top of the log, we can record the submarine type, submarine name, and captain's name with the initial rank of lieutenant commander. The ID and captain name have no impact on the game, but help to build the narrative of your career. This completes the setup. Now let's see how the game is played. When starting, the gameplay area should have the log sheet, submarine display mat, five player aid cards, submarine combat mat, dice, and markers. As mentioned, we will play through one complete patrol to demonstrate some of the encounters your submarine will experience and how to maintain the patrol log. Once all of the game components are assembled, we proceed with the sequence of play. At the beginning, we will determine our patrol assignment. This, of course, is only determined once per patrol. Each patrol takes two months to complete while the number of months required to complete refit can vary depending on submarine damage and crew injury. Once we are on patrol, we will repeat the conduct patrol phase for each travel box until certain events prevent us from completing the patrol or we return to base. The refit phase will only occur after we return to port after the completion of the patrol. Now let's determine our patrol assignment by consulting player aid 5 of 5. This player aid has table P1P for submarines starting in the Pearl Harbor base and instructs us to roll two six-sided dice. We roll a four and consult the column with our starting date of April 1942. We will start our first patrol at Midway. 
If the patrol has a special mission such as mine laying or transporting a passenger, it will have a mission type letter next to the patrol name. There are also some patrols where your submarine will be part of a wolf pack, as designated by the letter W. We then note the patrol log by listing Midway on the April 1942 patrol line. We can also note the starting base on the line above, in this case Pearl Harbor. We then move the Gato submarine marker from the port box to the area next to the first travel box on the patrol for Midway. Now that the patrol area has been determined, we can start the conduct patrol phase. We first move our submarine marker onto the first travel box, which is a transit area. We then roll two six-sided dice and check the transit column on the E1 encounter chart. A seven results in no encounter. The first time an unmodified 12 is rolled while checking for encounters, a random event is triggered, which would require rolling on the R1 random events chart. If rolled, the event is applied immediately. Only one random event can occur per patrol assignment. Since there was no encounter in this travel box, we move the submarine marker to the next travel box, which is also a transit box. We once again start the conduct patrol phase for the new travel box. We roll a 2, which indicates an aircraft encounter. Engaging enemy ships in combat is always voluntary, but resolution of submarine and aircraft encounters are mandatory. We begin an aircraft encounter by consulting aircraft encounter table A1 on player aid number 1. We roll a 4 which results in one successful attack to be determined on table E3 and one crew injury. No modifiers were applied. If we rolled for a successful crash dive, the encounter would end and we would move to the next travel box. Air attacks and anti-aircraft fire are considered to be simultaneous, so it is possible for a submarine to shoot down an aircraft that sinks it, as happened several times historically. The anti-aircraft guns must be operational to be fired. We will roll on table E3 first to determine the number of hits inflicted by the aircraft. Air attacks are always determined in the far right column, regardless of the date. We will only apply the plus one air attack modifier. We roll a four and add the one modifier resulting in five. This results in one successful aircraft hit, which will resolve after the anti-aircraft results. We refer to table A2 to resolve our anti-aircraft fire. We roll a 4, which results in damage to the aircraft. Since there was only one air attack, the encounter ends. We then consult sub-damage chart E4 on player A2 to determine what damage was inflicted on the submarine. Since there was only one hit determined from table E3, we roll two six-sided dice using the black die as the tens place. We roll a 31, which results in flooding. We move the flooding marker into the first box of the flooding damage track. When the flooding marker enters the final space of the damage track, the crew must blow ballast, immediately surface, and attempt to scuttle the submarine. In this case, we consult table E5 and roll one six-sided die to determine if there is additional flooding. We roll a two, which shows the flooding was stopped. Since combat has concluded, we can blow ballast and return the flooding marker to the left of the damage track. We also suffered one crew injury per table E3, so we must roll two six-sided dice on the crew injury chart on table E5. We roll a six, resulting in injury to generic crew. We then roll a three to indicate it's a light wound. A light wound counter is then placed on a generic crew box on the submarine display mat. We do not have additional combat rounds or damage to repair at this time. So we move the submarine marker to the next travel box, which is labeled Midway, and begin another phase of conduct patrol. On the E1 encounter chart, we will now refer to the Midway column since we have exited the transit boxes. We roll a 5, which results in a dash and SJ in parentheses. Starting in July 1942, and for the rest of the game, U.S. submarines were equipped with SJ surface search radar. Since we are in April 1942, the SJ radar is not yet available so we consider this roll as no encounter. If the radar was available and operative, we would roll the dice again. If another five is rolled in that situation, then it is considered no encounter. Since we do not have additional combat rounds or repairs to consider at this time, we then move our submarine marker to the next travel box, which is also labeled Midway. We roll an 11, which results in a warship encounter. 
At the bottom right of Encounter Chart E1, there is a footnote for the warship encounter in this travel box. We will identify the warship after we set up the combat mat. We then refer to the submarine combat mat in order to resolve combat. The right side of the mat lists the combat sequence. We first need to roll one six-sided die to determine the time of the encounter. We roll a three to determine it's a day encounter. We then place the day marker on the combat mat. In step two, we identify the ship targets. We do not need to roll for ship size since this does not apply to capital ships or warships. We must now roll for the warship ID. We consult warship target roster T4 and roll two 10-sided dice using the black die as the tens digit. The result is 62, which identifies the Shiguri as the target warship with a tonnage of 1600. The letters DD indicate the warship is a destroyer. We will then note the tonnage on the log sheet since it will contribute to our victory points if it is sunk. We may record the ship name as well, but that would be for narrative purposes only. Except for aircraft and submarine encounters, combat against enemy ships is voluntary. Determining whether or not to engage an enemy ship will be determined by your current submarine damage, crew injuries, and amount of ammunition remaining, while also considering that our victory level will depend on the amount of shipping we destroy. Since the submarine is in good shape and we have all of our ammunition, we decide to attack the warship. We place the escort marker on the combat mat since capital ships and warships always have escorts. We can have up to four targets maximum per encounter with one place in each target column. In this encounter, we only have one warship to target. We do have the option of also attacking the escort that is with the target ship. If we attack the escort, we would add a generic escort counter of 1200 tons to the combat mat in a separate target column. However, we will not attack the escort at this time so we can focus our torpedoes on the warship. Also, attacking the escort unsuccessfully would increase our chances of being detected. If escorts are attacked, their tonnage is also noted on the log sheet. If there is more than one ship marker, we can choose to fire at any number of targets or none at all. If we choose not to attack, the encounter ends and we remain undetected. We place the enemy warship marker in box 2 of the first target column since it is listed as 1600 tons and requires 2 hits to be sunk. Most boxes in the target columns show a number indicating the damage points required to sink it and the corresponding tonnage amount. Although capital ships do have tonnage values, they are not identified by tonnage on the combat mat. Instead, they are marked by damage values of 5, 6, or 7 per target roster T3. During a combat round, the ship marker is moved up the column one box for every damage point inflicted by our submarine. Although this warship's name was listed on the target roster, only capital ships have their own unique markers with their names indicated. Warships are specified by their ship type, so this warship was specified as a destroyer. The number indicates the number of hits required to sink this warship, which corresponds to the number on the combat mat. The arrows at the bottom of the counter indicate that this is a fast warship, which provides a plus one modifier to hit. However, frigates and destroyers receive a plus two modifier for their added maneuverability. Once all ships have been identified, we may attempt to switch to a night encounter with the risk of losing the target. However, this does not apply to capital ships or warships due to their speed so we cannot attempt to switch to a night encounter at this time. Next, we select the range of our attack. At close range, we are subject to escort detection before we fire our torpedoes, rather than afterwards, and at long range, we decrease our chances of hitting the target. So we elect to attack at medium range and place the range marker in the medium range box. We also decide to attack submerged, since it is a day encounter, and place the submerged marker in the appropriate box. And we place the incoming hits marker next to the incoming hits on sub column. We will use this if our submarine suffers any hits from the enemy. In step six, we assign torpedoes to ship targets. We will need to determine the type and number of torpedoes to commit to the attack. These markers will be taken from the submarine display mat and placed here in the bottom box of the target column. First, we'll decide to fire from either the forward or aft torpedo tubes. Using both in the same round will make us easier to detect and may only be done during a night service attack or against unescorted targets. We will commit four Mark 14 steam torpedoes from the forward tubes to the attack. So we will take these four torpedo markers from the submarine display mat 
and place them on the combat mat. We are required to commit the intended number of torpedoes before firing the first shot. Now that our four torpedoes have been assigned to the target, we will fire the torpedoes per step 7. We will roll per chart S1 on player aid card 2. If firing at close range when escorts are present, we would have to roll for escort detection first before firing our torpedoes. If firing at medium range or long range, we can fire first before determining escort detection. We have already decided to fire at medium range. Because the target is a destroyer and there are escorts, we have a plus two die roll modifier. We roll two six-sided dice per each of the four torpedoes fired. The first roll is an eight, so a plus two modifier would result in 10, which is greater than seven on the medium range chart and is therefore a miss. The second roll is a four. With a plus two modifier, the final result is six, which is a hit. The third roll is a five with a plus two modifier resulting in seven, which is also a hit. The last roll is a five with a plus two modifier also resulting in seven, which is another hit. So we have three hits and one miss. Any torpedoes that hit with a natural two are critical hits, assuming they are not duds. Critical hits allow us to add three when rolling for damage. We then see chart S2 to check for torpedo duds. We roll one six-sided die for each hit, so we'll roll three dice to check for duds. No modifiers apply at this time. We will check the results based on Mark 14 torpedoes fired in April 1942. We roll a six, a one, and a three, so we only have one hit per the six result. We then consult chart S3 to determine attack damage. We only get to roll one die since we only had one successful hit after determining misses and duds. We roll a two which results in three damage. The bottom of the chart reminds us that it only takes two damage to sink a 1600 ton ship. We then remove the sunken ship and the expended torpedoes. We proceed to step eight so the escorts can attempt detection. To determine escort detection we refer to chart E2. At the beginning of an escort detection attempt, we have the option of exceeding test depth in order to give us a negative one die roll modifier. However, we must also suffer one point of hull damage and risk the possibility of implosion and sinking. We will not attempt to exceed test depth at this time, so we'll roll two six-sided dice. There is a plus one die roll modifier since there is a warship escort, and a plus one modifier since we fired Mark 14 steam torpedoes during the day. We roll a 5, which means we remain undetected since the final total is 7 after adding the two modifiers. A roll of an unmodified natural 2 is an automatic undetected result. Per step 9, the encounter ends since all targets have been sunk and we remain undetected. We then circle the 1600 ton listing on the log since the warship was sunk. If the ship had only been damaged, we would have placed a check mark instead next to the tonnage. At the end of an encounter, or before starting another round of combat, we may reload our torpedoes if we have remaining ones available. Recall that we cannot reload aft torpedoes to the forward tubes or vice versa. We will move four torpedo markers from the forward reload box to the forward torpedo tubes. We then move our submarine marker to the next travel box. Some travel boxes are marked times two or times three. This indicates how many encounter checks we must make in that travel box. In this case, we must make two encounter checks before moving to the next travel box. We start a new conduct patrol phase by consulting encounter chart E1 and the midway column. For the first encounter check, we roll a 6, which results in no encounter. For the second encounter check, we roll a 10, which also indicates no encounter. We then move to the next travel box, which is still labeled midway. We roll a 4, which indicates we encounter a ship with an escort. We now return to the combat mat to resolve this encounter. First, we'll roll to determine the time of the encounter. We roll a 4, indicating this is a night encounter, so we place the night marker in the time space. We then proceed to step 2 to roll for ship size and ID. We roll a 6 to discover it is a large ship. To determine which target roster to use to ID the large ship, we roll one six-sided die. We roll a four, which instructs us to use roster B for our large freighter target. Table T2B for large freighters is on player aid card four. 
Using the black die as the tens digit, we roll two ten-sided dice, resulting in 39. The target ship is the large ship Norfolk Maru with 6,600 tonnage. The letter P in the roster indicates this is a passenger cargo ship. We then place the escort marker in the escort box and place the large passenger marker on box 3 in the first target column. The large passenger token shows numbers 3 and 4 to indicate how much damage is required to sink it depending on the tonnage. Since the tonnage is 6600, it requires 3 damage to sink this particular ship. We then record the tonnage on the log sheet for 6600 tons. We can skip step 3 since this is already a night encounter and go to step 4. We again select medium range since there is an escort present. We also choose to approach submerged. We then place the incoming hits marker next to the incoming hits on sub column. In step 6, we'll assign 4 aft torpedoes to the target. We will not target the escort at this time. We cannot use our deck guns at this time since they can only be used during surface attacks and cannot be used against A-type freighters or ships with escorts. In step 7, we can now fire our torpedoes. Once again, we start with chart S1 to determine if our torpedoes hit the target. There is a plus 2 die roll modifier due to the presence of escorts. We will also use the medium range column again. We roll two six-sided dice for each of the four torpedoes fired. The first roll is a 6, which then results in 8 after adding the plus 2 modifier, which is a miss. The next roll has a final result of 11 after adding the modifier, so this is also a miss. The final result of roll 3 is 4, which is a hit. The fourth roll result is a 7, which is also a hit, so we have a total of 2 hits and 2 misses. We then consult Torpedo Dud Chart S2 to check for duds. We roll one six-sided die for each of the 2 hits previously determined. We roll a 6 and a 1, resulting in 1 dud. We then check for damage from the one torpedo that hit the target ship per the attack damage chart S3. We roll a 6 which results in one damage point to the target ship. The bottom of the S3 chart reminds us that it takes three damage to sink the ship based on the indicated tonnage. We can now remove the four spent torpedoes from the combat mat. Since we only inflicted one damage to the target ship, we move the ship marker up one space showing that the ship needs two more damage points to be sunk. The escort will now attempt detection of our submarine. We refer to chart E2 and determine there are no die roll modifiers for this encounter. We will also not attempt to exceed test depth. We roll a 10 which means we were detected by the escort. The escort will now depth charge our submarine. After resolving the depth charge results, the escort will attempt detection again. This is considered one round of combat and this cycle continues until the escort fails detection which ends the encounter or our submarine is sunk or forced to surface, thereby ending the game. Since we were detected, we go to step 10. We then roll for hits on chart E3. We roll a 8, which results in two hits to the submarine. We can then place the incoming hits marker on the 2 space to help us keep track as we resolve each hit on the submarine. We then consult chart E4 to determine the resulting sub damage. We first roll a 35, which indicates damage to the hull. We then roll a 42, which indicates damage to our radio. First, we move the hull damage marker one space on the hull damage track. We then place the damage radio marker on the submarine display mat. We can place the incoming hits marker aside since we addressed both hits. We must roll for detection again on chart E2. There is now a plus one modifier since we were previously detected. We roll a four, which becomes a five after the modifier, which means we escape detection this time, thus ending the encounter. We then place a check mark next to the tonnage to show the target ship was damaged, but not sunk. On our submarine display mat, we reload our four aft torpedoes. We no longer have any aft torpedoes in reserve. We then attempt repairs. Hull damage is not repairable at sea, so we will attempt to repair the radio. We refer to chart E5 and roll one six-sided die for the radio repair attempt. We roll a one which fixes the radio. We can remove the radio damage marker from the display mat. If we had failed to repair the radio, we would have flipped over the damage marker to an operable. 
Inoperable systems cannot be repaired until the submarine returns to base, so we only get one attempt at a repair. We now move to the next travel box, which is also marked Midway. We consult and counter chart E1 for Midway and roll two six-sided dice. We roll our first natural 12, which requires us to roll for a random event on chart R1. We can only have one random event per patrol. We consult chart R1 for random events to roll two six-sided dice. We roll a 10. In this random event, we sink an enemy ship. We were instructed to record the tonnage of 10,500 and head immediately to base. This would have been treated as no encounter if we were out of torpedoes or had already sunk this ship. We record the tonnage and circle it on the log sheet since the ship was sunk. As instructed by the random event, we place our submarine marker back at our base in Pearl Harbor. Now that we are back at base, we can complete the refit submarine phase. During refit, we'll address crew injuries, submarine repairs, restocking ammunition, crew advancement, awards and decorations, and updating the log sheet. First, we'll address crew injury recovery. Lightly wounded crewmen heal automatically during the first month of refit, so we can remove the light wound counter from our submarine display. Serious injuries and KIA results will require additional rolls and replacements per Rule 10.15 in the rulebook. We will not determine the number of months required for refit based on the damage we sustain during the patrol. The base minimum duration for refit is one month. Additional months may be added depending on the submarine damage. The hull damage track is divided into three sections by two bold lines. We add one month for refit for each increment of three, or fraction thereof, of hull damage sustained. Since we had one point of hull damage, we would add one month to the refit period. We can remove the hull damage marker from the damage track. We will now address the submarine systems. Any type of damage except hull damage that has not been repaired upon return to base is repaired for free for up to two systems. If three or more systems are marked inoperable at the start of refit, one additional month is added to the refit period. Regardless of the number of inoperable systems, only one month is added to repair all systems. In this instance, we do not add a month to our refit since all systems are operable. We then restock deck gun ammunition and all torpedoes. Depending on the year, we may see the introduction of electric and acoustic torpedoes we can add to our weapons. We do not qualify for any crew advancement at this time. For every three successful patrols, we would roll to see if the crew's skill level increases or if certain crew members become experts. Each promotion attempt for the captain is made after the 12th month of service and then every 12 months thereafter. For this patrol, the captain receives the Submarine Combat Patrol Insignia, which is awarded for a successful patrol of any type. The submarine itself receives a battle star after each successful patrol. The awards are placed at the top of the display mat. Finally, we update the patrol log sheet. We note the total tonnage sunk during this patrol and add an S to indicate this patrol was successful. A patrol is a success if at least one enemy ship was sunk during the patrol, Otherwise, the patrol is a failure, and we would mark an F instead. We then place a P in the first month upon return to base because patrols generally lasted about two months. We place an R in the next month for the minimum one-month refit period. We must also place a second R for one additional month required by the hull damage. This means that our next patrol will start in August 1942. So in summary, we completed a successful patrol by sinking two ships for a total tonnage of 12,100 tons. We also damaged one enemy ship but was not able to sink it due to escort detection. The captain and the submarine both received awards and we incurred an additional month of repairs due to hull damage. Our next patrol begins in August 1942. Now let's review the victory and loss conditions for the game. There are several ways the game can end. The game ends upon completion of your final patrol leading up to or through July 1945. No patrols are conducted after July 1945. If any refit period, while you're in port, causes your next patrol to start after July 1945, the game ends. The game ends immediately if you are relieved as captain, killed in action, or taken prisoner. You may also choose to end the game early by opting out of command at any time. You would then calculate your final score at the point of your voluntary termination. 
Recall that the level of victory is determined by total tonnage sunk, or there is an automatic defeat if your submarine is captured due to a failed scuttle attempt or you are relieved for cause. The rulebook provides a sample patrol log sheet to see how to calculate the victory level. In the rulebook, the example game ended when this submarine was sunk on its fifth patrol after sinking a total of 34,600 tons, which resulted in a draw. This example log also shows different ways to record target ships. Only tonnage was noted for the first two patrols. For the December 1942 patrol, a letter was added for the type of ship, such as F for large freighter or P for passenger. For the May and October 1943 patrols, the targeted ship name was logged above its tonnage value. A check mark was placed next to damaged ships and sunken ships were circled. The S at the end of each row for the first four patrols indicated a successful patrol, meaning at least one ship was sunk during that patrol. A crew advancement check was conducted at the end of patrol 3, and a Bronze Star was awarded after the May 1943 patrol for sinking three ships. This concludes this review of Silent Victory. Visit us at these sites and don't forget to leave a comment about your experience with this game, or let us know what game you'd like to see reviewed next. And if you'd like to experience something more exciting than moving silently in the middle of the ocean like a can of tuna, stick around for our disclaimer. Coming up next.